Welcome to Mostly Minutia. I'm Colleen Lindell, and this is episode 36, Make Space, Part 2. And if you're just stepping into the story and weren't able to catch part one, that's okay. I'll get you up to speed. I do want to say, however, it is one of my favorite episodes to date, and I do recommend checking it out. So whether you pause here and go back to episode 35 or intrepidly press on without the full backstory, it is entirely up to you. Either way, let's take a moment to recap. So in part one of Make Space, we got to know Kristen Huffman, who at the time of the interview was my teacher in a class called Yoga Booty Ballet. Think 80s, 90s, Grooves class meets Katy Perry meets Kendrick Lamar meets Flashdance. So outside of the little universe that was this class, I literally knew nothing about Kristen's life. We were what I like to refer to as friendly acquaintances. I will tell you this though. It was the first time a class made me cry and truly feel the art of vulnerability and letting go while at the same time totally empowering. And Kristen being the teacher was a huge part of that. So I originally set out to interview Kristen because of how much she had impacted my life and rumor on the dance floor was that she would soon be moving to New York. Fortunately for me, she agreed to a chat and one sunny afternoon we found ourselves sitting in her bedroom in Glassell Park as she graced me with insightful details about her life growing up in St. Louis, going to university, living in sorority, and moving to Los Angeles. And then, about three quarters of the way through our conversation, I asked Kristen to tell me a little bit about her upcoming move to New York. And here's what she said. So my intentions have become progressively stronger as I've become stronger over the years. And the last couple of years I've called in, uh, this is so personal, I can't believe I'm sharing this, but I've just called in, you know, the next chapter. I've wanted to call in my partner and my family, my future family. Like, how did you call in your partner? I first started praying for him. And when I say praying, I mean, I believe that we are all embodiments of something really profound. I believe that we are all divine. And I believe in a quote unquote God. And whether you call that setting intention or meditating or praying or connecting to your higher self or tapping into the collective consciousness, whatever you want to call that, when you're plugging into being a channel of love and like letting that divine goodness flow through you, that's the ultimate. So I just started focusing on him wherever he was in the world, doing what he needed to do to be ready for me, and then calling in the work that I needed to be doing for him. And so I would just send him little blessings, like little wishes, like wherever you are, I love you. I know you're finding your way to me. And there were definitely times when I was like, oh man, I don't know if this will ever happen for me. I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Am I cut out for this to be married and like start a family? I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a reason I haven't found that yet. And then I just made a decision to believe in him. So originally I was just going to sit down with Kristen for an hour and then call it a day. But knowing that she had been actively calling in her life partner for a few years, praying for him even, and that that prayer had manifested itself into an actual human person and that this was the sole reason for her move to New York. So I've realized through the process of doing this show, and I don't know if this happens to everyone who does long form interviews, but I often go into a story based on a hunch, a gut feeling that there's a tangible depth to someone's story. Even if I know nothing about their story, I can almost feel it like an inherent knowledge And then throughout our conversation, as we peel back the surface layers, a deeper story is revealed. And this definitely happened with Kristen, and I definitely needed more time with her. So when we got to the end of that first interview, I asked if she'd let me follow her further into her journey. She was totally game. And nine months later, an opportunity presented itself. Kristen was back in Los Angeles for a short stint to teach a dance class. We met in Hollywood at Epiphany Space, which is a co-working space I frequently podcast from. And this is how our conversation went. Kristen, so it's been about 
let's see, August, one, two, September, October, November, December. Oh, it's almost nine months. Yeah. Since we've spoken with each other. Yeah. It's been nine months. I last spoke with you in August, right before I was moving to New York. And I was um, stepping into this exciting chapter and exciting life change. And uh, I, I just think about that time as a really precious kind of sacred time where a lot of things were coming into alignment and there was such a tremendous ease around what was changing. Um, there's a reason for that phase. Like there's a reason why we're given grace and ease. And then there's also a reason for the next phase, which can be significantly more challenging when the rose colored goggles come off and you hit reality and you hit obstacles and you are choosing those original decisions again and again to remind yourself and to stay um, positive about what's going on because um, um, so I guess that's what I have to say is that the last seven months of being in a new city of really committing to another person has been like one of the hardest chapters I've had in my life. It's been full of self-doubt, uh, needing a little more like recognition or um, acknowledgement. Like, hey, where are the signals that like the I'm doing okay? I don't know if that makes sense. I don't think I'm being very articulate right now about my chapter, but basically it's been really hard. <laughs> it's been so hard, but it's really important to know that like these chapters are okay because this is where like tough learning happens. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe walk me through when you first got to New York and then just the that first month of being there. Yeah. And what your life was looking like then. Yes. So the first month of being there, a few pivotal things happened. Um, my partner and I, well, we kind of encountered the challenge of living together in a small space. <laughs> so like you've got two people with two people's stuff in a small amount of space. And I think it's really important to have room to have the time that you need oh my gosh yeah I don't I'm not I don't think I'm articulating this very well you know what my problem is right now what feeling like I want to remain this very positive voice um the last time we spoke I was so self-assured I was so clear I was embarking on something really amazing and it's been amazing but my perspective is very different now. And I feel hesitant to put on the record, like, that the story has to go that direction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel, I feel like panicking right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's just stop for a second. Needless to say, I felt horrible for Kristen. And we ended up just talking for a few hours just off the record, which I think is ultimately the best way to go when a friend is in pain or having a panic attack. I left there feeling slightly bummed that it didn't work out, but willing to accept it and just let it go. And to my surprise, I got a text from Kristen later that day saying she wanted to try again. And so the very next day, she came over to my house. We sat in my dining room and Kristen, to my amazement, did not hold back. We even unpacked why she started to panic the day before. A huge thanks to Kristen for her willingness here. It takes a brave person to open up for an interview in the first place, um, but to dive into difficult topics with such grace and honesty is a true testament to her strength and character. A few notes. In the last episode, I hinted at the fact that Kristen is also a sound therapist. She offers sound baths by playing crystal singing bowls, and later in this episode, we touch upon a story about her singing bowls. And also, at the end of the interview, we discuss a photo series Kristen has been posting on Instagram called Guys with Flowers, which is simply, and not so simply, just that, 
Pictures of Guys in New York Holding Flowers. It's a powerful little series and I think really gives you some insight into the blossoming love that Kristen has for New York. Okay, that's all. Please enjoy episode 36, Make Space Part 2. Are we recording right now? I just started it. I thought we should just start and... Yeah, and I wanted to know, like, shall we reference the other day? We can, yeah. Yeah. So I'm really glad. Thank you for inviting me to do this again. Um, We met the other day to record as this kind of follow-up nine months later. And as I began sharing what felt like deeply personal things I my like I had a physical reaction to it and I I started panicking as though I was suddenly providing information that like I felt protective of my partner and this whole experience that we've been through and so I just kind of like shut down and I think it's really important to talk about what that was exactly um because what's really great is that you and I got a chance to talk in August when I was going through a really fun time a really exciting time and it's really important to like talk about those celebrations you know when everything seems to be going right and it feels really powerful and you're celebrating and everyone's celebrating with you but then how do you talk about the chapters that are really tough Mm -hmm. and when you don't feel like celebrating case in point I think it's Mm -hmm. really important to kind of break down those weird walls we build around those times and to say you know what things aren't super easy all the time like it's really easy to be a love warrior and be like I love love I'm in love with love love is (laughs) you know when you're in love Mm -hmm. and then not to suggest that you're, I'm not in love right now, but to say like in the tough times when you're not, when you're not flowing with that, when you're like, man, things are confusing, things are frustrating, things are cloudy. Um, to be a love warrior even then, to mm-hmm. say I love love, I trust love, I love love, to continue to invite it and trust it. You said the other day, you said it, it, it's a choice. Or sometimes it's a choice, like choosing to love in a moment. I think in re- in a relationship where you get to a place where things are very real and you're looking at each other and you're saying to your partner, like, I see you and you see me. And wow, it's fun to do that when, when everything's awesome. But when things are challenging and um, you're tr- you're, the things that you're triggered by come up or you know, your shit comes up, Mm -hmm. then you're looking at each other and to say, I see you and I know you see me Mm -hmm. is an incredible, incredibly vulnerable place to be. And you know that you're being held accountable by that person in such a beautiful, wonderful way, but that you're also being asked to grow and shift and look at yourself and not be too proud to make an adjustment And this is where we start to see deeper things and take things deeper. And uh, you don't know until you get there that it's going to be like, oh, I need to learn how to navigate this now. There's no precedent, really. Mm -hmm. You've never been there before. You moved to New York Mm -hmm. in August. Yeah, I just realized how obscure I was being. (laughs) It's so easy for me to get so <laughs> obscure, but anyway. But it makes yeah. sense though, because you can't, there's no way that you can prepare for this challenge that's going to come present as an opportunity to you. Yeah. It's not like it came to you in a letter like, dear Kristen, we would like to present this opportunity for you to embark on a maturing and growing process. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a lot of uphill battles. Would you like to engage? Right. When you moved to New York, so right away when you moved there, did you step into a challenge right away? Right away. It was instant. Um, it was during, in the moving process. I began, my own identity felt like it was, like I was so protective of 
my stuff and I had to get rid of a lot of stuff. And I was so protective of like who I am and Hmm. what my things are. And I was being asked by this process to like recalibrate and um, to move into a smaller space, to share space, to go to a new city where I didn't have my network, Mm -hmm. my, my people Mm -hmm. and really trust in my partner. So that ultimately is a really beautiful thing, but it's also, it creates a lot of pressure Mm -hmm. on both he and I to like, you know, I think it's in a guy's nature to really want to make sure you're okay Hmm. and provide what you need so that you're happy. And when you see someone struggling, it's really hard to just say like, okay, well, this is a part of it and we're just going (laughs) to, you know, it's like, oh, what can we do to make this work? Mm-hmm. right now mm-hmm. and the truth is it just takes some time to unfold hmm. yeah maybe just describe for me what your day-to-day life was looking like when you first arrived there mm-hmm. and if it's changed at all now yeah <clears throat> it's really cool to um compare LA and New York because in LA I lived in this very whimsical um like duplex in Glassell Park with a hillside of avocado trees and succulents and green and flowers and birds and cats and coyotes. And and then I moved to a five-story walk-up in Manhattan with, like, so physically, you know, like there's a little bit less light and there's a there's a significantly less room and um even the logistics of like okay instead of like parking my car and walking up a few stairs and I'm home it's like I get off the train and I walk four blocks and then I get into my building and I go through one door and then I go through another door and then I go up five flights of stairs and then I get in and I'm I'm in my little safe zone so my days were spent trying to find my home And that was both, you know, our new living space that we anticipated finding that was going to be a little bigger and like within the right price range and with the right, um, like with the washer dryer hookup, which is just ridiculous. And then I started to find, look for my home for my classes for yoga booty ballet and for sound baths. And, and I began looking and I hit a wall. And I was looking, I mean, this is what I was spending my time doing. You know, my job was just to pave the way for my classes to take shape, for the community to form, which I I really trusted. I knew that there was a community in in New York that I was going to build and a group of women that were going to make this class amazing. And I just had to find them. And I just had to find the space. And it took quite a while because I would rent one space and there would be an issue like oh well you can we're only going to let you rent this one time or okay you can rent but it's going to be like $150 an hour or something or the the fitness landscape in New York is different I feel like there are studios that are like branded Um, this goes back to how spoiled I was at Heartbeat House Heartbeat House is independently owned by a wonderful woman named Kumbi who really holds the space and Hmm. sets the bar high and is like an extraordinary individual. And uh, people like me can come in and and do something and grow a following and it's not a competitive environment and it's not overly branded. No one's trying to say like, this is it and you have to fit within this. Mm Mm-hmm. So to go into a branded place, which I understand, like, business model-wise, to cover the overhead of, of having a business in New York, and the real estate expense, et cetera, you've got to know what you're doing. And people like saying, oh, well, I like SLR or whatever, so I'm going to go to mm-hmm. SLR classes, and I'm going to buy a package of SLR classes, and this is my SLR class. Mm-hmm. And it's at 5.30 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, it's a very scheduled 
group yes, of people. Yes, and classes there are quite expensive for for like these niche classes. They're quite expensive, and they're like forty five minutes. And you go in, and you're like bam, 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 and then you're out. And I was really fascinated by this because I was like, wait, where's the place where you go and you just kind of like kick it? And you're like, you're still getting the most amazing workout, but it's, the environment itself is a little more open. Hip hop studios? Yeah, I think there are. So I think that there are some places, but then introducing myself like, hey, I'm Chris and I teach this class. And, um, it, and it's something that no one's ever heard of because it's right? so, it's like this special unique little thing Mm -hmm. so i finally found a place called pmd and it's a dance studio Mm. um 14th and 6th and and that's part of manhattan that's That's, part of manhattan that's great near union square and they gave me a shot and that's really what i needed was just somebody to say okay here's a class time so let's see how you do and so we have the one class (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on Saturdays? Every Saturday? Yeah, on Saturdays. How long did it take you for to, for you to find that studio? Like four months. Wow. Yeah. Because I would just go in a studio and then it like wasn't the right fit. And then I'd try to rent places and they weren't the right fit. Yeah. So I just invested a whole lot of my own time, energy, and money. And I think I underestimated like how much that would actually require. Mm-hmm. But other things have taken shape. I got accepted into advanced study at UCB, which is like the improv program I was doing here. UCB New York. UCB New York. And I signed on to take an intensive class at another theater called Reckless. It's another form of improv. And I I performed a couple times and I'm loving it. So I'm just trying, you know, like taking the pressure off of... Um, the way I thought things were going to go mm-hmm. and letting things unfold in what has proven to be more beautiful, more beautiful things have come up than I could have anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, what have been the things like when you immediately walked into, or, you know, when you were in the moving process and then when you got to New York, what were some of the things that kind of were just in your face right away challenging was it right away with you know in your relationship or was it just the overall like life got flipped turned upside down type of thing yeah it was all of it I I think um my own personal my own personal practice like the things that I need in place to be my best self are like okay like regular exercise and like like a good sweats you know and yoga booty ballet is my way to do that Mm -hmm. it feels like my my church um so there's that there's also that element of comedy of of practicing uh (laughs) self-trust in in improv i mean i i fell in love with improv because of these things because it felt good for my brain because it felt good in my body and because i know that practicing comedy as well so much funny stuff comes up when you let go Mm -hmm. and when you don't overthink it so these elements and then also the female camaraderie Mm -hmm. that I have grown to rely on. Like, I really cherish the new friends I've made. They're like, they have this extra special place in my heart because, like, I had to really find them, Mm -hmm. you know? And and you only need a couple or or one, you know? You just need somebody who you feel like is your your comrade. Mm -hmm. Um, Exercise, humor, uh, camaraderie, and meditation. So also having the discipline to do that and it's a discipline's a hard thing to create when you are in a dark place or mm-hmm. when you're feeling depressed or when you're feeling like a fragment of yourself mm-hmm. and depression is kind of a catch-22 and I mean depression on a grander scale like the moments in life that that are uh, cloudy mm-hmm. where you're not really sure what the next step is and it feels icky But you have to just trust that this too shall pass. And sure enough, it does. But like when you're in those moments, it's you have to create the discipline 
to have your things in place, to have some level of structure so that it's just not a free fall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like your job that you show up for, or sometimes it's like you know that at 10 a.m. you're going to have your meditation time, or Mm -hmm. you're going to pray, or you're going to, I don't know, but Mm -hmm. those things get you through and you rely on them. They're like the stilts on the pier. There are the lights on the runway, and then you just trust that mm-hmm. you can take off from this place mm-hmm. eventually. Um, but when when things get tough and you you begin to revert back to like old patterns or old thoughts, and you're not necessarily in your like strong empowered place. Yeah, um, it's very hard to be the partner you want to be. It's very hard to be the you know, it's hard for me to be the woman that I, that I want to be. Mm -hmm. And so do you know what I mean? So like, yes, my strength, my strength fled me for a bit and, and it came back. Hmm. Kristen, do you feel, cause this is actually, this is your story. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you have to talk about you know, who Mark is and, you know, what kind of a person he is or anything, but... He's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about him a little bit? Um, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave him out of this, but okay. he is a really extraordinary guy. Um, can you say for you what has been or what was, what's been challenging for you? You know, like what I'm trying to get towards, like at the, you know, in you talking about that is... Because you had talked about the other day that that there is pain, or no, there is pain because there is love. Mm-hmm. But you had said it's worth it. So worth it. And I think that's a positive thing that people need to hear. I think that relationships are just difficult. And there can be years of things not being difficult. And then there can be, you know, it's seasons. There can be seasons of, of yeah. difficulty and and to keep it in our minds and our focus on that it is worth it. Yeah. And why, you know? Well, I think, um, man, what a beautiful experience it's been to know a true partnership and to know that, um, if something comes up for him or something comes up for me, neither of us are running and you can begin to rely on that person. So I'm feeling trust, really knowing trust. And it's not, it's not like a, an experiment. It's like, oh, this is what it feels like. Really knowing trust um, for the first time. Mm-hmm. And that to me is such a great gift. But oh my gosh, what a challenge it is. Mm-hmm. Because you're taking you know, past experiences and you don't intend to bring them in as baggage, but you, you're like, okay, well, this is, this is my reality that Mm -hmm. I'm opting in to be super vulnerable. So like that, that whole honeymoon phase where you're like so drawn and, and things are on a physiological level happening so that you can connect, so that you can build a foundation, so that you can latch Mm -hmm. that's for a reason because then that next chapter is like, okay, now what happens when, and I've got you, you've got me. Like we're not, we're neither of us are running We're we've opted in. And so I think that factor, the opting in, like you cannot know what's around the corner, what kind of challenges you're going to face, what kind of stuff is going to come up for either of you. But you've opted in and you know that that is such a gift. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. Like, it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. Like, to know how much he has, the kind of space he creates for me Mm -hmm. is like the most beautiful thing I felt. Hmm. And I'm sure that he feels that way about me too. Like, the kind of space I create for him to have his experience. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds like like a very selfless, inconsiderate thing of creating space for somebody to like 
let it all hang out. I guess that's what like partnership really has felt like for me. It's like me kind of stepping, growing up in a way where things get real and you mature and you become more selfless. If you can take a break from when it's always just been you Mm -hmm. and your kind of like self-absorbed reality and say, I really love this person. And like, it's, it's, it's hard to be seen by them when you're not at your best. Mm. But, um, then they, they like don't go anywhere and you're like, wow. (sighs) You were saying the other day that, um, you had dated people before who never really wanted to make a commitment. Well, I think it was just a matter of like thinking that you're doing the right thing, but you know, just not being ready for Mm. that. So you're saying you weren't in the right, you weren't in the right place either to be in a commitment with that, even though you were, you were thinking like, Oh, I'm ready. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you know that this isn't the person for you. And Hmm. so there's just less you're willing to do. Mm -hmm. I feel that in myself, Mm -hmm. like maybe it's a protection over my energy, but I can feel myself just like shutting down and not even wanting to spend time with somebody Mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. I don't, it's not like I've been dating really anybody, but a few years ago I did go on a date and I just remember thinking, man, just getting up the energy to go out on this date feels really exhausting to me. Mm. But I think it's because I knew that ultimately, you know, I wasn't really attracted to that person and and I probably wasn't going to be with them. Yeah. Yeah. So like that level of honesty with yourself and honesty with that other person is like so badass, and again, so worth it because you know, you're, you're, I think we're teaching everybody around us how to treat us all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. And if we say no, it means we're holding out for the right thing to say yes to. Hmm. And you know that what you have to offer energetically is, is such a special thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether it's a friend or it's a romantic prospect, like you don't, you just don't give it away all the time. Mm hmm. What's been the biggest challenge for you? Or could you name some of the challenges that you've gone through? Well, on a personal level, I felt the the physical space, sharing physical space um, with the person you really love. Suddenly you're like roommates and you're best friends and you're lovers. Mm -hmm. Um, But you don't have like a separate compartment for all those things. It's like all intertwined. And so I think I need time alone to process things. And um, I find that in New York, like your time alone is your time at home. But then if that space that you share with someone isn't, if it doesn't allow you to kind of like separate and just kind of be at peace with whatever's going on with that other person, then you can truly restore. But if you're so wrapped up and intertwined and like, oh, I don't know what's what to do about this thing and you're putting off this energy and then that person's absorbing it and you're not giving each other the space to kind of like be your best selves. Like you've got to show up constantly as your best self with each other and then be okay with like if someone's not there that the other person can like step up to meet them and say like, no, no it's okay. You have your experience. I'm not I'm not judging you right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it seems like I'm dancing around this topic, but I don't think I can pinpoint what the exact things are that yeah. I've struggled with other than like finding my people and finding my places. Mm-hmm. Um, re, I guess I don't want to say I've like done any redefining of myself mm-hmm. because I know who I am, but like seeing myself in a new landscape and seeing how I do and like, okay, there are some things I'm really good at and some things I'm, I really am not good at. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, what can I do to keep this like beginner mind hmm. of learning and receiving and being curious instead of being judgmental, mm. both of myself and of all the new people I'm meeting and of my partner all the time, just kind of keeping a level of curiosity and, and at the same time wisdom. Mm-hmm. You're all knowing truth instead of reverting to a place of like this isn't for me or like i am this and i'm not that you know instead of instead of just being like no i'm Kristen and i'm here 
<laughs> and I'm just ah. gonna, I'm just gonna be grateful for what I'm experiencing to today on this this Thursday. This is a brand new Thursday. I've never experienced this Thursday before. I've never experienced this Thursday. Holy cow! <laughs> Hello, Thursday. Two days till I get to teach my YBB class. And yeah. Well, in the little victories, you got to start st- celebrating the little victories when the big ones just like, you don't even know anymore. I mean, it's just so easy to feel like, holy moly, I am swimming upstream. I have thrown myself into the situation and this is so hard and I don't know what's happening and like I don't even know where I'm going to teach my classes. I don't even know like where I am right now. Like I'm physically even lost and like I guess I I don't really have anything profound to say other than like reality, transition, mm-hmm. finding your way uh, is was just hard for me. Like just putting myself in a new place where everything was different. Mm-hmm. Everything was different. And now I can see why I was doing that. I mm-hmm. mean, I can see why it's beneficial to put yourself out there mm-hmm. and put yourself in a new situation. I can't imagine not knowing what it's like to live in New York. So like I look at that now, I'm like, well, I definitely don't regret going. Mm-hmm. I definitely don't regret taking this leap and jumping in with my partner and in this love and trust and new city. And can you explain why it's worth it? Like why you think it's worth it to go through this kind of process? Because the expansion that it is requiring me to, it has required me to um, grow and get super gangster strong and trust myself and think about so much more than just me really think about my partner and think about my new friends and what it what it takes to have a friendship that's not just kind of like handed to you and what does it mean to be a good friend what does it mean to be a good partner what does it mean to carry your groceries three blocks and up five flights of stairs what does it mean to take your laundry all of a sudden to a laundromat when you've owned a washer and dryer for the last few years and what does it mean to not have your car that I think in LA becomes this like meditative use space Mm. and all of a sudden you're like just on the street with a lot of people and on the train with a lot of people and what does it mean to live life out in the open all the time gosh I think that's like what New York is you're living life out in the open all the time And here I am with the only space that's like my personal space and I'm out in the open with this other person. Mm -hmm. So someone said to me, wait till the first time you cry on the streets of New York. Like that'll be an experience. That'll be like a a moment. I thought, gosh, what does that mean? Does it mean like everyone stops to help you? Is there something like (laughs) unspoken, (laughs) some unspoken New York rule that like (laughs) if you see someone crying or... No, like, no, people just walk <laughs> on by. And the um, the first time I cried was when I was carrying my my crystal singing bowls to a friend's house who, who had invited me over to offer a sound bath. And I overextended myself because I think I was, like, I was excited for this new opportunity, and this is something I love to do, the, the sound baths. And I'm, like, I'm, like, carrying all my bowls, and it's the New York Marathon. And I'm in the cab, which was a splurge. But I'm like, I'm taking a cab from Park Slope back to Manhattan because I've got my bowls. I can't, I can't like carry these things on the train. And you can't like carry them and then like knock them against things either. Like you've got to like kind of hold them. And I, it was a New York Marathon. And I'm trying to get back for this other thing. And I, I tell the taxi driver, I'm like, I'm just going to get out here. I see a subway and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to get out here. And I get out of the car and I put my bowl down and it tips off. Like all it did was basically tip off of this ledge for that was like two inches off the ground. And I heard something and I opened the case and inside is my very first bowl, my G bowl. And it half of it, it's like a 14 inch bowl. So let's say like a seven inch chunk is just gone it's just in pieces Mm. and 
it happened so fast and I just sat down on the street and like cried my eyes out and I mm. thought oh my gosh I can't I can't do this mm-hmm. I can't even carry my bowls around mm-hmm. I can't even get from point A to point B why is point A to point B so hard mm-hmm. <sighs> I shouldn't have been carrying my bowls. How do I take responsibility for this? Now how do you carry your bowls? How do you get them from places? Well, I really just don't. I make people either come to me or I I have somebody help me down the stairs. Mm. And to the car. And I absolutely just take an Uber or a cab anywhere I'm going. Mm-hmm. But I ask for help. That's great. <laughs> That's a really sad story, actually. But guess what? My partner, this wonderful guy I keep mentioning, we sat with this bowl in our place for months, and we both agreed, like, we can't just put it in the trash. And he said, what if we took the broken pieces and figured out how to file them and polish them, and you could give a piece to everyone in your community back in LA, the people who like allowed you to do this. And so we found a place that took 45 pieces of my bowl and filed them and polished them and drilled a hole in them so that they could be strung on something. And at the retreat last weekend, I passed around a little bag and everybody picked out a piece and and then they found out what it was and now Everybody has like a piece of the bowl. <laughs> I have a couple left, Colleen. You're getting one. It's in the car. Okay. I would gladly accept. You are kidding. I just think that's so cool. Um, we have about 15 minutes. I feel like maybe we should cut this at 22. I don't know. What do you think? Should we stop now? I wanted to talk about the the pictures of the men holding flowers oh yeah but I also wanted to I wanted you to say something quickly about women being expansive yes I loved that image that I had when you said that the other day yeah it was empowering to me as much as I really believe that um as beings we are so much less uh separate than we try to make ourselves like there's truly a unity and a unifying force but I also believe that women, I mean, women and men are different. We are different beings. As women, we have an innate abundance to us. And we have an energy that can be extremely magnetic. And when we tap into that and we know it and we operate from it, uh, it's very powerful. And when we connect with each other, it can be very powerful as well. What what does expansive mean? Like, how can someone, like a woman who hears this, understand what that means for her and what kind of power she actually has and it doesn't have to give away her power? Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like women give away their power a lot. Right. Um, well, because we have this ability. We have this ability to kind of nourish, you know, literally and figuratively. We're We're built to kind of create and nourish and expansive is like okay the best way I can describe this in like a real term is when I think about my life I think about all the many pieces and all the many colors and all the many it's like it's kind of always in me Hmm. it's always swirling around all the many pieces all the many things I I believe that sometimes you know we, we just don't think in in linear ways Mm -hmm. there's an expansive nature to us so like there's a lot that we hold at any given time Mm -hmm. and that is a form of intelligence whereas our male counterparts might be really talented in other ways this is a form of distinctly feminine intelligence the expansive nature of our hearts and our minds and the way they are constantly dancing and swirling i know that sounds really um well it's not a very unscientific explanation but that's just how i feel about 
female intelligence. Yeah, I I can see it too Mm -hmm. when you say that. Tell me about these photos that you've started doing. I mean, have you ever been really into photography or is this something that you just came up with this idea to connect with New York? My boyfriend is a photographer. He's a very talented photographer. This for me was just um, the element of living life out in the open. You know, you'll see someone crying. You'll see someone laughing. You'll see someone talking on their phone. Like in New York, it's all out there because you're not you're not compartmentalized by your your vehicles and and whatnot like you're in spaces together and so it's not unusual to see someone walking down the street with their groceries or to see someone walking down the street on a date you just see people living and you see people buying flowers on their way and i just i immediately fell in love with that aspect of new york and to see a guy buying, like, I, I cannot help myself. I'm like, so what are those for? <laughs> like, yes. Where are you going? <laughs> um, and every single guy I've asked has been open to sharing what he was doing with the flowers. And yes, it's always sweet when they're like on their way to a date or they're on their way to take them to their wife or their girlfriend. I think my favorite stories so far have been the ones that had nothing to do with romance, actually. There was a guy who received a flower because it was his last basketball game. He was a senior in high school, and it was his last game, and so the coach gave them all like a flower to take home mm. or something or wear. So I just really like hearing those little stories, mm-hmm. and I'm certainly not the first person to document these things in social media, but it's been fun to have one eye open for that while I have my own experience. Mm -hmm. Hashtag ghost of flowers. Well, you know, there's humans of New York. Yeah. I just was thinking, man, this is a sidearm of that. It's so pinpointed and it's lovely. Like I want to look at a book or an album of men holding flowers and hear their stories. I think it's really cool and a great way to connect with the city. Just closing here. I, I was thinking earlier when I was going to the store this morning about how, you know, places here are usually kind of small in LA. They're not like gigantic spaces usually. I mean, obviously they're not as small as New York or like what you get for your dollar there. But a lot, I think even if we live in a small space here, a lot of what makes it better is that we can live most of our lives outside. And so I was thinking about that. I was thinking, man, so Kristen's living in this small space, you know, sharing it with the man that she's in love with. And then when you're outside, you are dealing with elements. So you, you have to go somewhere to get away from that. But it's interesting hearing your thoughts about this because you're saying you're always in the open Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I think here, even if we get to be out in the open, we're not bombarded with, because not everybody's not on top of each other here. Right. I mean, some neighborhoods are. Um, certain neighborhoods are, are for sure. But here it's like, even if we're living outside, partly outside, we're, we can still hide in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely exposed. All of me is exposed in my relationship. There's a level of honesty that is at first like terrifying. Mm -hmm. And then you expose everything you expose who you are you expose your thoughts you expose all of your inner workings Mm -hmm. and you share that with somebody um and then in new york you are exposed you're exposed to the weather you're exposed Mm -hmm. to the other people um it's quite hard to hide Mm -hmm. um and i i'm i'm now super grateful for the experience of knowing what that feels like Mm -hmm. to be so unabashedly myself Mm -hmm. in three months or a little over three months Mm -hmm. should we meet again yeah and talk i think so to see a schedule of Kristen's latest dance classes sound baths and retreats go to feelsprettyawesome.com or you can follow Kristen on instagram at feelsprettyawesome where she also posts all of her upcoming events Just a little side note, the first time I had a sound bath with Kristen, I experienced synesthesia. 
I don't even know if that's how you say it. And I didn't even know what that was. But it's when you experience one sense in the body through the stimulation of another sense in the body. For me, Kristen played a frequency and that frequency came in through my ears. And yes, I could hear the frequency, but I also saw the frequency in color. It was a bright, luscious orange color that was so saturated, it was practically dripping with flavor. And I've never seen this color in real life. My only guess is that the frequency somehow tapped into several pathways in my brain that culminated into this full-bodied color experience. A very non-scientific descript, I know. I've also seen a few other colors since then, violet and gold, but only with the crystal singing bowls. If anyone has had an experience like this or cares to comment on this at all, please send me a note. I would love to hear your thoughts. Mostly Minutia at gmail.com. The cover art for Mostly Minutia podcast is an actual painting created by Eva Fan. To find more musings by Eva, go to evafan.com. As always, you can find links to all of these in the show's description, which you can find wherever you're currently listening to this episode. Just scroll down. And lastly, I just want to say congratulations to Thomas Pop. Thomas is a sound mixer based in Los Angeles. He just started a niche boutique podcast on sound mixing and working in the film industry. And actually, I think a non-industry listener can benefit from this too. Not surprisingly, the sound quality is on point and his guests are fantastic. The show is called Video Mantis and you can find it on Apple Podcasts. And I've also posted a link to it below. And now I've totally gone rogue, speaking completely from the heart. Thank you to Dean Gorman. Dean and I went to high school together. We also went to college together. Dean is a writer, and he has now united his force with my force and is helping me to create the intros and the outros for this podcast, which is actually the most excruciating part of making this podcast. I know it's hard to believe, but crafting the intros and the outros for the listener, it's so hard for me to figure out what it is exactly that I want to say to you. And so Dean is allowing me to pretty much dump everything out onto a page that I would love to say to each listener. And then he helps craft it into something that's listenable. Dean, I am ever so grateful for you and your talent. This episode of Mostly Minutia was recorded on location in my apartment in Glendale, California.